Okay, here's the next thing. Learn to think like a fish. This is the second step. Learn to think. You must understand the habits and preferences and feeding patterns because certain kinds of fish like smooth water while others like rushing water. Certain kinds of fish live in open oceans and others hide under rocks. You need to know the kind of people God has called you to reach. If you're going to reach unbelievers, you must understand how they think. The Bible says this, Jesus knew what they were thinking. Now, that's, that's pretty good. That's why he was so effective. He knew what they were thinking. That would be easy. If we knew what they were thinking, we might be as effective. But Jesus said this also, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Wise as serpents, so to study people. That's the second principle, learn to think like a fish. So learn to be strategic in our thinking. Often church only fulfills the second part of that. We usually are harmless as doves, but we're not wise as serpents. Paul said it this way, be wise in the way you act towards those who are not believers. Be wise in the way you act towards them. The problem is the longer I'm a believer, the less I think like an unbeliever. Isn't that true? Usually within three years of someone becoming a Christian, they don't have any more lost friends because they get sucked into the bubble. You have to think like your target. You have to learn how they think. A missionary can go in a country and pray all he wants to and teach all, all he wants to or she wants to and plan all they want to. If they don't learn the language, nobody's going to listen to them. Right, Tom? You're here someplace, Tom Gillespie. There you are. I see that hand. I'm a trained professional. I see that hand. So you have to learn to speak the language. So, Tom, how long did you study Spanish? Five hours a day for a year. And he went as an IMB missionary. You mean to tell me, Tom, they paid you for a whole year to sit around and study Spanish? See. Why? Because he would be ineffective without speaking the language. Now, when we went to Cuba, this is what we did. We went to Cuba. I taught pastors, and I was translated by Mitch, Mitch Ingram. He translated, and he's amazing. Mitch speaks better Spanish as a redneck from Texas than the people from Cuba speak. And what Tom did, he went back to the guys that, he, that I trained, and he trained them in Spanish how to train other pastors. Because the gringos got to go. And the, the, the indigenous movement has to spring up. Y'all understand that? Yo, Johnny, you were with us on that trip. You remember that we were giving the Cubans. In fact, at our Building Lives Conference in September, we're having two Cuban pastors join us. They're flying over from Cuba, and they will be here. If you have a home or an extra room or an extra cottage people could stay in, please let Amber know. We've got people coming in. Uh, a lot of Spanish-speaking people are coming in to be a part of the Building Lives Conference. So you have to learn the language of the 21st century. You have to learn the language of unbelievers. Don't talk in religious terms. Have y'all noticed I'll use a religious term and then I'll tell you what it means? Like sanctification means becoming like Jesus. Sacerdotalism. That means taking the Lord's Supper. So we can't use, like when I talk to somebody, I'm not going to talk to me my, my, my eschatological stance as a premillennial dispensationalist. <laughs> I'm not. Do y'all know what eschatology is? It's the study of the end of time. Do y'all know what scatology is? It's the study of poop. <laughs> so you better understand what you're saying, and that's why we, we have to say things that are plain. Let me give you some examples. We have a youth group, and we call it Echo, 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 echo. What the heck does that mean? What does that mean? Echo. Why not call it student ministry? <gasps> Where people actually know what we're talking about. Wouldn't that be helpful? Oh, it got quiet. V VBS, that's another one of my pet peeves. We're going to have VBS. Do you know average lost person doesn't know what the heck VBS is? Did y'all know that? And we say to kid, you come to vacation Bible school? School, I'm not coming to school. <laughs> but see, we can, we can change our words to reach our target. If you say, hey, you want to come to the best week of your life? Join us this week because we're bringing all these kids and we're going to have a lot of fun. 
We call it Kid Week. And it starts, do you see what I'm saying? And what we do is we get insider language. You know who's the worst about insider language? The absolute worst, our government. They got acronyms and the military. Any of y'all military folks? Uh, you know, it's insider language. And, and so we have to think, what do they don't understand? Do y'all know why I put the passages of scripture I'm using up on the screen? Why do I do that? Why do I do that? Right. And usually when I say, turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah, the state Bible school, you know, the Bible drill champion sitting by the person who's first time at church, they're going, <laughs> and they're looking at the table of court and they're going, who's this guy that's very short named Nehemiah? <laughs> so we project the passages so people can follow because we want it to be accessible. Is that loving? Well, some people say, well, it's not the Bible if it's not leather bound. Uh, it's got to be the book. I have a friend of mine, he was so brilliant, he memorized his sermon and he memorized the scriptures he was using with his sermon. And his church started complaining he wasn't preaching out of the Bible because they didn't know scripture know well enough to know that he was quoting it. So what he did, he took his black day timer and he preached holding that and the people quit complaining because they thought he was using the Bible. Okay, I'm going to move on. Y'all want me to move on? Resistance is often just poor communication. They really don't know what we're saying. I hear Christians saying all the time, people are close to the gospel. No, they're not. They're not close to the gospel. They're close to the way we're presenting the gospel. They're not close. They're close to the way we present the gospel. Uh, how can I get on their wavelength? How can I learn to share the gospel in their language in a way that will, they will understand? How do I understand the mindset of an unbeliever? Just ask them. Give them time to ask their questions. Build relationships with them. I've written these things down for you. Uh, if you don't ask the right questions, you won't get the right answers. If you don't get the right answers, you won't develop the right strategy. If you don't develop the right strategy, you won't get the right results. Five questions to ask unbelievers. Are you currently active in a local church? Hey, you go to church anywhere? I was in a flooring store this week because when we were remodeling our house, I built a relationship with a guy that has a flooring store. So I was by there, so I stopped in check on him, see how he's doing. He was, you know, he was working on stuff. I said, hey, it's good to see you, preacher, blah, blah, blah. Walked out, and there was a lady standing there. She said, can I help you with something? I said, no, I'm here. And Tara was there. And, of course, Tara's always looking at something. She likes decorating and that kind of stuff. She's looking. I said, you know, I'm just here. And, and I, I, said, um, I said, hey, um, I'm Pastor Scott. You go to church anywhere? She says, well, and she starts telling me her long story. And pretty soon, she was telling me everything about her life. And I got to preaching, and she got to crying, and I took up an offer, and we bought lunch. No, <laughs> it was just people want to be heard. They want somebody to talk to. And if we avail ourselves, hey, do you go to church anywhere? And of course, I invited her here, and I think they're probably going to watch online to make sure I'm not crazy. So y'all pray for that. What do you feel like is the greatest need in your area? That's a great question to ask people. What do you think is the greatest need here? What do you think the most people don't attend church? What are you looking for in a church? What kind of things would you like, to, would like for that church to have? What advice would you give me and how can I help you? I did that as a church planner. Hey, what advice can you give me in planning this church? How can, you, well, how can you help me? And people are always willing to help. Here's the things I've discovered. This is what people say. Sermons are boring and irrelevant. They're boring and they don't apply to my life. Now that dad gum preacher here last week, he preached for 50 minutes. I promise you, he will not do that this week. My wife had roasted preacher for lunch last Sunday. <laughs> Members are unfriendly to visitors. That is not the case here. And I love you guys for that. Too much emphasis on money. That's why I say we're not after your money, we're after your heart. Giving is an act of worship. If you're a guest today, this is not for you. 
There's poor child care. From time to time, in fact, it's more often than not, Tara, are, I, uh, we are invited to come look at pastors' church buildings. Church buildings. And so last week, pastor called me. He said, hey, would you and Tara mind coming by our building and, and just checking it out? And so we were down in that area on Tuesday, and we're coming back from Victoria. We swung by, and we went to this place. Building was built in 1940. They have not cleaned the carpet since 1940. It smelt like a gym sock. And the people have gone nose blind to it. They see it. There was mold growing on the walls. The ceilings were falling in in different places. And they wondered why people did come. They said they had some young, he, this is a young guy. He said, I had a young family come with their kids and they started back to the nursery and they went, now nah, we're just going to take it with us. And the nursery was the best area they had, y'all. And so, you know what he did Wednesday night? This was Tuesday. We stopped and looked. Wednesday night, he confronted the people with it. And listen, they began to weep. And they said, Pastor, nobody has ever had the courage to lead us like this. Now look around our room. We have a beautiful place here, don't we? But you know what? It's going to go out of style pretty soon. So what do we need to do? We need to be thinking ahead. We need to pay attention to clutter. Pay attention how things smell. Pay attention. Pay attention. Whose job is it? It's the staff's job. No, it's not. It's our job. Our job. I remember when I was in Canada, one Sunday, I went into the men's bathroom, and it was a mess. It was a mess. So I start cleaning up. I start wiping stuff up, start cleaning up, clean up, clean up. This a church of 5,000 a weekend, y'all. I'm the senior pastor. I'm in there cleaning up. Our, our maintenance guy walks in. He goes, oh, Pastor, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing? I said, Dennis, just relax. It's a mess. I'm going to clean it up. It's okay. Then I looked at him and said, Bubba, we're in this together. I'm not above cleaning toilets. Y'all, I was a janitor for three years. It's okay. It's okay. We are in this together. Y'all see what I'm saying? So we have to make things look acceptable. Go where the fish are. Here's a conclusion. Most unchurched people are not atheists. Go where the fish are. Let our target determine our approach. Let your target determine your approach. This is the heart of a building lives strategy. Start where people are, not where you want them to be. Y'all, the kids from Gary Job Corps that are getting saved, they're going to be messy. They're going to be messy. We start reaching unchurched people here. People start coming to Christ in Wimberley. They're going to be messy. You're going to hear stuff you wish you hadn't heard. You're going to walk through them with stuff that you wish you didn't have to walk through. Suck it up, buttercup. That's the way of the world. The early church changed the world by love. It was said of the early church, when a plague hit a city, the people ran away and the Christians ran in. Do you know why we have orphanages today? Because the Romans would leave their babies on the hillside to die and the Christians would adopt them. Why we have hospitals today? In the Roman world, when you got old, you just died. Christians started caring for the elderly and the affirmed and the afflicted. Why do we have higher education today because in the Roman world only the elite were educated and so Christians started educating everyone do y'all know most of the great universities in the United States were founded by Christians for Christian principles Harvard was started to train pastors Princeton was started to change to train pastors oh Go where the fish are. A really good fisherman will do anything it takes to catch fish. Most of us fish by setting up our lawn chair, getting our cooler, throwing out our bait, lowering down our brim, and taking a nap. And if a fish is caught, it's an inconvenience because then we have to clean it and cook it. Huh. What kind of fisherman are we? Do we have a take it or leave it attitude? Do we put up a sign that says, here in our church, you got two choices. You can take it or leave it. 
Here in our church, you just show up on time. You sing what I want to sing. You, say, you wear what I want you to wear. You believe what I want you to believe. You know when to stand up. You know when to sit down. You know when to shout, and you know when to fight. When I was pastoring in Victoria, I had an associational gathering, and this guy came up, and he basically preached this. We're at the church. We're supposed to be exclusive. We're not supposed to let people in who don't know Jesus. He literally said that. He said, when you can sing what I sing and like what I like and dress like I dress and believe the Bible like I do, you can come to Jesus. Other than that, you just go on your way. I was in the sound booth when I heard that. I started coming out of there. And one of my associate pastors grabbed me and said, settle down now, don't start something. I said, I'm going to start somewhere. He said, you settle down. And then afterwards, I walked up to our associational director. I said, look, man, I can't have another one of your gatherings here not unless I vet who's speaking here, because we are a church that reaches broken people. We are the fellowship of the broken. Come and see, Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, hey, get your act right, then come and see. Is that harsh? Have you ever thought like that before? Y'all are looking at me strange. Am I going to lose my job? Hmm. It starts changing things because behind every face is a story. And in every story, there's a hurt. And in every hurt, there's a healer. And his name is King Jesus. John, you need to say something. Go on, brother. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. Wow, John, that's a great question. I guess I might as well go ahead and tell you all this because I've already volunteered us to Dwayne York to adopt that school over there. I said, we're going to feed the teachers. We're going to let people park over here. We're going to provide, when we, when we expand our children's building, we're going to provide after-school care. We're going to create, hopefully one day up on Ranch Road 12, a people where people can come and gather. We want to extend Blue Hole where people are walking, can come on this campus and walk and have a refreshing time, maybe drink some water, have some scripture. We're, we're going to be that church. And you know what Dwayne York said? Come on, brother. Come on, brother. So God is putting us an opportunity to lavish love right across our street. Right across our street. Does that scare y'all at all? No. On Tuesday nights, we are, we, we've got a food tray, a food truck coming. It ought to be here in the next month or so. On Tuesday nights, a team of people headed by Larry Adams are going to go feed people that are hungry at the cry, where when they're getting the food bank, that team's going to go feed people on Tuesday nights because they're hungry. They're hungry. Somebody gave us the money to buy a food truck. It was King Jesus. And so what King Jesus is asking for some of y'all to be broken bread and poured out wine to feed hungry folks so they could hear about Jesus. Does that excite y'all at all? And so we think about community impact. We think about reaching people. But John, as we do that, we also think about reaching people that are far away. When Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, he didn't say then, he said, you will be. All four at once. So that's a good question, John. Did I answer your question? That's the strategy moving forward. Now, here's another thing, y'all. Get it in your heart. See a need, meet a need. See a need, meet a need. Don't come to me and say, Pastor, we ought to start a ministry. Blah, 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 blah. Just start it and tell me you started it. Okay? And we'll throw gas on your fire. And so see a need, meet a need. Every member is a minister. Not every member is a pastor, but every member is a minister. 
When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you, Jesus told the disciples in Luke. So what we're talking about here, he's giving more than a dietary advice. These principles to adapt to our local customs and culture as long as it doesn't violate the Bible. God's word is our guide. Too often we ask the world to adapt to us and then we act arrogant if they want. Are you willing to adapt to the uncomfortable to reach the unchurched? Never compromising the message of Jesus Christ or the direction of the Bible. This church will never preach anything else that Jesus Christ and him crucified. Will not. We will not depart from the authority of Scripture. We, we, won't, we won't. We won't. On my watch, we won't. Now, what they do after that, that's, that's y'all's job. And so we have to do what God wants us to do. Uh, the Gentiles didn't have to become Jews to become Christians. So we have to think about the same thing. Uh, let me say this about catching fish. I have never caught a fish that was cleaned and ready to go in the frying pan. <laughs> Do you know that? So when someone comes to Jesus, we gotta let Jesus clean them up, right? And you know what? Jesus is still cleaning you. And some of y'all are a big old mess. He's cleaning you still because he loves you. Your Christology shapes your ecclesiology, which shapes your missiology. What you think about Jesus shapes your view of the church, shaping your view of the mission of the church. This church exists to be the hope of the world. All for Jesus. Paul's strategy. To the Jew, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. In the same way, we're working with, when working with Gentiles, I become like a Gentile in order to win the Gentiles. I become all things to all people so that I may, uh, so that I may save some of them by whatever means possible. Now, whatever person is like, I try to find common ground and, and with him so I will, and he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him, Paul goes on to say. Now, a lot of times when I say this, when I teach on this, people get jumpy because you don't hear what I'm saying. We will not compromise scripture for culture. We will not adjust biblical truth for cultural norms. Y'all got that? Y'all hear me loud and clear? Okay. Jesus' standard approach, he didn't have one. Jesus didn't have a standard approach. Jesus' standard approach was start where the people are. So when he was farmers, he talked about farming. When he was fishermen, he talked about fishing. When he was, uh, he talked about tax collectors, I guess he talked about money. He, he, when he, the woman at the well, he talked about living water. He starts where people are. So sending people out to share the gospel strategy. The needs of the unbeliever determines our programs. Jesus said, it's not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So if there's a problem with divorce, we start divorce ministry. Problem with addiction, we start addiction ministry. We start recovery ministries. If there's a problem with, uh, that's be celebrate recovery. If there's a problem with weight loss or parenting or, or marriages, we want to build programs to meet people's needs. We focus on those felt needs. Jesus, Jesus often said to unbelievers, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Jesus asked them that. People will say to me, in fact, pastors say, well, pastor, we don't need to preach that felt need stuff. That's copping out. That's not giving them the full counsel of God. I said, wait a second. God's word applied to our lives meets our needs. Meets our needs. And uh, we don't have time. Maybe we will one day. I teach a class to pastors called Preaching for Life Change. Y'all hear it every week. There's a system and a strategy to why I teach, why I teach, and how I teach it. Does that make y'all feel weird when I say that? It's intentional. Why? Because I love you. I love you, and I want your lives to be full of God's best. Nobody becomes a Christian until they first recognize their need. And that's called conviction of the Holy Spirit. Before you can share the good news, you must first capture their attention. And that's meeting needs. Our church will never grow beyond its capacity to meet needs. 
The felt needs of unchurched are primary emotional and relational. They're primary emotional and relational. They have hurts and habits and hangups in their life and their relationships have not met their expectations. Do you know what the number one downloaded message I've ever preached has been? It's been on marriage. God honoring marriages. Because that's where the needs are. Hmm. Jesus never lacked an audience because he dealt with major themes that I just mentioned. You can use anything as a felt need to reach people. I heard about a church that went out uh, out years ago, door to door, and found out the biggest need in their area was young couples needing to potty train their children. So they started a class for potty training children, and they reached hundreds of young couples for Jesus. Wow. Hmm. In fact, over 500 couples showed up for the potty training seminar. <laughs> we could probably do that for senior adults here, couldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, there's a proverb about that. Train up a child in the way he should go. Okay, all right. The mindset of unbelievers determines our strategies. For instance, a lot of people are hung up about financial appeals, so we tell visitors, don't give. We're just glad you're here. That's why we do that. We must do whatever we can to remove the barriers that keep people away. But do that, we must have to understand their mindset. Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than we are the people of the light. Jesus said in Luke 16, 5. The culture of unbelievers determines our style. Huh. This is especially true when we determine our style of our gatherings. I want you to write a phrase down because I want to let you in on a little secret. We are using the arts to touch the heart. So that what does that mean? We have a creative team that's led by Dan. They meet every week and they prayerfully plan our gatherings. And they say, we want to pick songs that speak to the hearts of people. So we're using old songs. We're using new songs. We're using songs that are honoring. Dan will tell you, I'm the theological police. If I don't think it's right, Dan, what do I say? I speak up, don't I, Dan? So that song sounds like a Hindu song. We all not sing that. We're not taking Jesus to the prom, Dan. It's not God is my girlfriend. And so we have rich heritage songs we use, and we have some good new songs we can use. But I like all kinds of music. And so we want to use the arts to touch the heart. And that's we want you to be inspired and engaged. Engaged. Don't you think for a second we're doing something to placate you. We're doing things to inspire you to live all for Jesus. Is that too hard? Why? Because we love you. We love you. Why in the world did I sing Great Is Thy Faithfulness last Sunday? Why did I do that? Why did I do that? Exactly. It is a good song. And it ought to be sung. We're going to open up in a couple of weeks singing the mighty fortress is our God. Yeah, we're going to open up. Why are we going to do that? Because we're going to be talking about overcoming opposition in our lives. And Martin Luther faced a ton of opposition. And there's probably no better song to sing. A mighty fortress is our God. Right? That's not hip and cool. I don't care. I'm sweaty and I got a bad hip. I don't want to be hip and cool. I want to be effective. Don't you want our church to be effective? Y'all, we're not going to be a laser light church and smoke and lights and other churches want to do that. That's fine. That's between them and Jesus. That's not who we are. We're not going to be that. In fact, if you had my preference, we'd be a little more redneck than we are. Aren't you glad we ain't getting my way, right? We'd be singing, God is great, beer is good, and people are crazy. No, we ain't going to sing that. We ain't going to sing that. But it's that determines our style, how we dress, what we sing, how we, we offer people a chance to come to Christ, how we teach. The key question is, who are we trying to impress? Are we in trying to impress other Christians? Are we trying to impress King Jesus and communicate to people who need Jesus they can find hope in Jesus? 
It's all about motivation. Number four, find the fish that are hungry. Focus on the most receptive audience in the area. Usually people are hungry when they're under transition or tension. When people move, they're more open to the gospel. When people have a baby, they're more open to the gospel. When people lose a spouse, they're more open to the gospel. When people are sick in the hospital and hurting, they're more open to the gospel. When people have a financial need, they're more open to the gospel. When key people have a rebellious child, they're more open to the gospel. Heck, when people have children, they're more open to the gospel. Are y'all with me? When people have loved ones suffering from Alzheimer's, they're more open to the gospel. So we look for people under transition or tension. That's a guaranteed strategy, okay? Now I wanna say this. There are some people who are real far and some people that are not far. Go after the not far people first. Have you ever heard somebody say this? I think before we go after any new people, we ought to go back and round up all the old people who left the church. Y'all ever hear people say that? That is a strategy for disaster. Move with the movers. Love everybody, move with the movers. It takes 10 times more energy to reclaim somebody who's gotten upset and cantankerous than it is to go out and win somebody new. God called us, I don't know if I should say it, but I'm going to. God called us to feed sheep, not corral goats. <laughs> Healthy churches focus on reaching receptive people. Unhealthy church focus on re-enlisting inactive people. Love everybody, but move with the movers. Most people are receptive in their under tension, under tension, a transition and intention. I've already covered that. Number five, use more than one hook. Use more than one hook. Often people offer people choices. The more fish, uh, the more hooks you use, the more fish you'll catch. Become all things to all people. So it's, you may some of them uh, to save some by whatever means possible. So we live in a world full of choices. So there's saturation strategy, using every available means to reach every available person at every available time. And that's why we wanna do multiple services, multiple gatherings rather, multiple groups, on-campus groups, off-campus groups, uh, multiple ministry opportunities. Why in the world do we have a choir? Why? I'll tell you why, is why. It gives people a bigger, more easily accessible opportunity to minister. You have three praise team members and you can have 100 people in the choir giving glory and honor to the Lord. Why? Oh, a second. Because it creates a dynamic in our gatherings. Our choir is important. You know the third thing it does? It tells people out there, hey, you could be a part of something bigger than yourself. That's why we have a choir. That's why we're never gonna kill the choir. Choir, that's why you're the hero. That's why we're talking about getting more of you. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Why? Because I love when people are engaged serving God. Serving God. I was at a big old contemporary church not long ago. And they had 350 people in a choir singing their hearts out. I know some of them couldn't sing a lick. It didn't matter. You got 350 people. You could even cover up Wyatt when he's singing. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. It's just too easy. But that's the joy of having people and reaching the right people. The wrong question is to ask is, how much will it cost? The right question to ask is, how much, who will it reach? Who will it reach? Most churches are driven by faith in the early years and driven by finances in the later years. Let's talk about financing, uh, facing, let's talk about financing sharing the gospel for a minute. Financing sharing the gospel in our church Money spent on sharing the gospel is never an expense. It's an investment. It's an investment. Churches never really have money problems. They have ideal problems. Hudson Taylor said this, God's work done God's way will not lack God's supply. Not lack God's supply. Get that next slide up there, Scotty, so they can put that in. God's support, God's supply. 
Okay. Any questions? Comments, questions? All right, let's go on. I'm, I'm flipping ahead. Helping, uh, helping people determine their target. Two questions determine your target. What kind of people are we already reaching and what kind of person am I? The best, re best reached, the best reach people have is the ones you relate to. You attract what you are, not what you want. So here's some uh, uh, options when your church doesn't match your community. You can build on your strengths. You can reinvent your congregation. You can start a new congregation to need to reach new groups. So what we're experiencing here, y'all, and I'm gonna be really honest with you, we're experiencing a revitalization. What does revitalization mean? What does that mean? Taking something and making it new again. Right, what, what else did I hear y'all say? Making a change, revitalizing. Okay, girls, I'm gonna tell y'all something y'all gonna love. About every eight years, you need to revitalize your kitchen. I know. That's all. Sorry, Paul. You should, because you know what? Harvest gold is no longer a color for your refrigerator. <laughs> you should not have carpets in your bathrooms. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Your, your um, what is it? Your, your southwest tile motif is no longer in style. So we have to revitalize. We have to refresh. We have to renew. We have to, do we have to, to do, to do those things, right? Now, Tara's not here tonight because I gave her the night off so I could tell this. Tara goes to the beauty shop about once every six weeks. She does. It costs me a dadgum fortune. She goes down to this place, and this old girl fixes her up, and she's pretty already. I don't know why she's wasting her money, but she comes back, and she's all gussied up, and her hair's a new color. Heck, I don't even know what that girl's original hair color was. Y'all don't repeat this now. <laughs> Do you know why she does that? Because she knows she needs to be revitalized. And you know what it does for her? It picks her up. You know what it does for me? Ha, ha, ha. That's none of your business. So, you see, we have to think about that. We revitalize. Now, when I say we're revitalizing the church, am I diminishing you? Am I putting you down? Am I insulting you? No. No. I'm loving you. I'm loving you. When I go to the doctor and he says, Scott, you need to lose some weight. Is he insulting me? Maybe a little bit. Mind your own dadgum business. You need to eat a sandwich. That's what I say to my doctor. But here's the deal. He's loving me. He's loving me. You know, um, I went there the other day, and he said I was fat, and I asked for a second opinion. He said I was ugly, too. I don't know what to say. He's got a new talking scale, my doctor does. Yeah, I got on the other day, and it said one at a time, please. So... Okay, that's enough of that. Okay, we're done with session two. Any questions y'all have, thoughts? Was this helpful at all? I know you're not pastors. You don't pastor church. You're part of this family. But I wanted you to look under the hood, okay? This is the stuff we're teaching pastors. Do you think it's helpful to pastors? Big time. Big time. Big time. Okay, now we got 15 more minutes, and I want to get as far in chapter and session three as I can. Is that all right?